Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, good evening. I would like to welcome you to today's VU Matters, VU Talks, a VU uh, public discussion on the trends towards deglobalization. My name is Tatjana Opitz, and I'm the vice rector in charge for infrastructure and digitalization here at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. VU Matters, VU Talks is a series of unique panel discussions and lectures. And with this format, VU has created a platform with a clear goal to facilitate knowledge sharing between academia and public. The objective is to address economic, ecological and social issues, thus contributing to their better comprehension as well as initiating an accountable action in order to find possible solutions for these kinds of challenges. Scientists, researchers and experts from the corporate world as well as from public institutions are invited to share their expertise on current issues with an interested audience. One of these global challenges is for sure deglobalization, the topic of tonight's panel. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope you are intrigued uh, by today's discussion on deglobalization as much as I am. The, grow, uh, the growing public discontent with globalization has led to increased nationalist and protectionist policies in economies around the globe. These policies affect how companies operate internationally, especially with regards to their global value chains, resulting in important implications for international development. Tonight, our guests will discuss the potential effects of a slower globalization or even deglobalization on the economic development of emerging and developing countries. I would like to take the opportunity to thank VU's Department of Global Business and Trade for organizing tonight's panel discussion. Moreover, I would like to introduce Professor Alexander Moore, who will be tonight's moderator. Alex is Professor for Export Management and Internalization Processes at Wirtschaftsuniversität. Furthermore, he is the Director of the Master of Sciences Program Export and Internationalization Management. His research interests include international strategic alliances, internationalization processes, non-market strategies, as well as human resource management in multinational enterprises. Last but not least, let me warmly welcome our three distinguished guests on our virtual panel. Professor Harvis Mirza, Professor Annie Wai, and Professor Abel Kinoti, who will share many valuable insights with us tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. I wish you all a very interesting discussion and will now hand over to Professor Alex Moore. Thank you very much. Alex, the stage is yours. It is mine. Hello, everybody. Welcome from my side um, as well. As, uh, as uh, Tatjana pointed out, I'm Alex Moore. I'm here, a member of faculty at the Department for Global Business and um, Trade. And I'm very happy to um, be able to bring in three top experts on the topic of deglobalization and um, international development to this um, panel discussion. I was going to give a quick introduction on, on the topic, but I think Tatiana has already um, given you the gist of it, so there's no need for me to actually repeat um, what she has said. What I would like to do is, of course, uh, give you a bit more information about our um, um, speakers, our panel, and to do so, let me try and share my um, screen with you. All right, I hope you can see my screen. Um, so the three Oh, sorry. Okay. 
sorry, that didn't work out as planned as usual. Now, second attempt now. All right, so unfortunately not in the presentation, but at least you can see it. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to, um, I'm thrilled to, to welcome three esteemed speakers here. We have um, Hafiz Mirza, who's with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, he's also a professor of international business um, at Reading University, and he has worked with the United Nations um, Conference on Trade and, and Development. So he knows a lot about um, international business and international um, development. His most recent work um, is on the role of multinational enterprises um, and the achievement of the sustainable development goals um, by 2030. And he has co-edited a special issue on this very topic at the Journal of International Business and Policy, which has, um, published, has been published, I think, quite recently. Um, the second and panelist is Annie Wei, who is a chair in international business at the University of Leeds in the United um, Kingdom. Annie has um, issues related to um, foreign investment, um, international trade, um, innovation, economic development, with a particular focus on investment um, going into and coming out of uh, China. And the third panelist um, tonight is Abel Kinoti, who is the Dean of the uh, Riara Business School or Riara School of Business at uh, Riara University in, in Nairobi. He's also the founding chair of the Sub-Saharan Africa chapter um, of the um, Academy of International um, National um, Business. And he um, has worked specifically in the area of innovation and um, business um, incubation, social entrepreneurship, um, and also um, analyzed alternative strategies for economic development with a focus on um, the African um, continent. So I think overall we have uh, three expert um, speakers and, and uh, scholars on this topic and, and um, we will have um, a very interesting um, discussion. Now, the plan is that I will, of course, be, be moderating this discussion. We will start out with uh, opening statements from our three um, panelists. And after that, I will um, ask questions or make comments on, on each of these um, statements, raise a number of issues. Now, although I do have a, a lot of questions for our panelists, of course, um, I would like to encourage everyone following us on, on YouTube to post um, questions or comments that they have in the, the, the chat function, which I assume is on, on your right hand side. And I will keep an eye on that um, chat to bring in these comments and questions into our um, discussion. Um, also, the video will be um, recorded and will be available on, on YouTube after the um, event. Right, so I guess I have said everything. Of importance, and I will hand over without further ado to, to Hafiz. Right, so the floor is yours, Hafiz, and I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, um, Vice Rector Opitz, Alex, colleagues and friends, um, I suppose good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are in the world. That, that's globalization for you already. Um, I wanted to sort of just start this important topic on, on deglobalization and international development by uh, mentioning four key things, which I think will help to sort of, in some ways, guide the discussion that, that follows. The first point I want to make is simply that global value chains are not a thing. The second thing I want to say is globalization and deglobalization are, are not things either. The third point is basically unfettered globalization is in fact a terrible phenomenon and it has to be addressed. So again, that's probably the main, main issue to discuss. And the final point I want to make is basically that deglobalization, whatever we call it, how we define it, is in my view not really a reduction in globalization because, you know, for example, if you're drinking, drinking water, you don't say you're waterizing or underwaterizing, you're basically drinking water from a glass. It's half full, 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 quarter full, it's still water. Uh, and the same applies to globalization, deglobalization. 
what is happening, I think, is basically a shift in the pattern of globalization. So, so there's a bigger set of activities in one part of the world, a smaller set of activities in another part of the world, different type of activities and so on. So the pattern is shifting and, and, and that's something we can come back to. Let me start with the first point. When I was at the United Nations uh, some years ago, well, not that many years ago, but it was at the United Nations, um, it wasn't unusual for ministers or policymakers to come to us and say things like, you know, global value chains are a really good thing. How do we get one? And now, I think by and large, to be fair, that was really a badly phrased question. But it does indicate that actually people don't fully understand what GVCs are, and quite often they misunderstand the topic. And that, of course, is a big issue when it comes to GVCs, globalization, deglobalization, and so on. So the first point then is GVCs, global value chains, are not things. Rather, they are metaphors for how companies arrange their international production, both internal, for example, through FDI or through contracts uh, with other, other uh, suppliers and so on, as well as distributing the products that they produce to markets around the world in a whole myriad of different ways. A company like Nestle, for instance, would have tens of thousands of global value chains, depending how you define GVC or GVCs. And then if you take that point and then multiply Nestle's GVCs uh, a million times over with all the different international companies that we have, you add in global financial markets, you, you, uh, you add in international tourism, you don't forget international migration and so on and so forth. What we get is a visual picture of the sheer scale of globalization and what it entails. So when you say ups and downs, it's not a lever you crank. It actually is, is, is a very different phenomenon to what people often think. So basically, the second point, um, globalization and deglobalization are not things. Uh, I won't go into the definitional issues because if, uh, if, if me and Abel and Annie start on this, it will take us all day. So I'll, 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 I won't do that. But the point I want to make is this, that in, in general, what we, when we refer to it as, as, we, uh, as you do, Alex, in the paragraph about this, this, this topic, when you say public discontent on globalization is rising, in my view, it's misguided because most people don't actually know what they mean by globalization. They talk about something, but it may be that it's not what, what they think they're talking about. In particular, um, in developed countries, um, the discontent against globalization is often a reflection and a desire to return to a golden age, real or, or mythical. It's a sense of entitlement. We used to have this, why don't we have it any longer? The point to make here, I think, another point to make here is, is for example, first of all, there's no reason why cars must be produced in Detroit. Secondly, let us not forget that, that globalization and shifting global production has led to a vast increase in international development across the globe, and particularly in Asia, Southeast Asia, less so in Africa, less so in some other parts of the world. There are issues to be sure, but uh, if you start saying, let's deglobalize, who are you going to deprive and in favor of whom? There, there's a big issue to be, to be addressed there. And I think especially a problem because in today's world, with, with uh, and you mentioned things like national protection in, the, in your paragraph, uh, Alex, um, this perspective on globalization and why we need deglobalization is actually uh, problematic when populist politicians seize upon the topic. Most of these politicians, of course, are self self styled geniuses, and they seize on an amorphous public concerns and embark on nationalist policies. These policies are often uh, are, are misguided; they're often self defeating, and nevertheless, they create a lot of damage. In, the, in their wake. I think that's something to we, we have to address. Uh, and, 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 and in my view, uh, it's, it's a pressing concern for all of us, not just in, in, develop, in the developed world, but also in the developing world. Because of course, quite often, they're the ones who actually are affected. The, point, the third point is, I'm not saying that globalization is, is necessarily a good thing. Um, what I would say is unfettered globalization is not a good thing at all. There are issues and the problems. Um, and just to give you two, two examples out of many, many that, that myself and Annie and, and yourself and, and Abel will be able to produce. The first issue of I want to mention is excessive 
and rising inequality, national and international. Um, this is, has been occurring since the, since the onset of globalization. When you look at the numbers, you see that you come through the, the data. Um, it undermines not only uh, the, 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 the populace per se, it also undermines the stability of the system in many ways. We go to why that's a problem, but I won't do that now. But basically, inequality is a big issue, and it creates problems not just for, for uh, developed countries, but also for, for developing countries too. The second point, as an example of, of uh, landlords not being a good thing, is the consequences for the environment and health, which is linked. The climate crisis, a whole range of these types of things. For example, when Bitcoin mining requires approaching 1% of global electricity production or consumption, much of that being concentrated in China and using non-renewables, then Houston, we have a problem. And that's just one, one case of a global activity, which is not even real in the sense of, a, of, a, of physical activity, but nevertheless, it has consequences. But the solutions to these ills, the solutions to these problems, are not nationalist or protectionist policies, at least not policies which actually pander to certain interests uh, and which are ill-constructed and ill-defined. Uh, for example, um, and, and there are ways of de dealing with it. For example, uh, uh, just to take uh, international and, and, and local, there are plenty of global initiatives to try to address the problems associated with, with, with globalization and, and related to that matters. For example, COP, the, the regular climate conference that we, we, we have every year, every, every so often, and the next one is in, in Glasgow this year in, in, in the UK. We have a whole range of initiatives related to the Sustainable Development Goals. So these are there. They're not being uh, fully addressed. These issues are not fully addressed. A lot of these things that are being proposed are not being implemented. But the real problem there are basically, in many cases, your nationalist, protectionist um, tendencies and the politicians who actually then uh, prevent the adoption of things that actually will make things better. So I think, you know, in a sense, um, for me, these policies are a problem, not just in general, but also for actually addressing the issues associated with, with globalization. The other thing to say is that I think what you do need is, is basically to address not globalization in a general sense, but specific issues which globalization uh, creates. Is you need concrete uh, policies, you need to be specific, you need to be deliberate, you need to be rigorous. And you often don't get that enough. Where you do often get it is actually at the national level and the regional level. And I think there are, there are again, there are initiatives that we can discuss, which I, which I think are worth pursuing. We do need to get, get to be actually very rigorous about it. And as an example, something I'm doing uh, uh, at ISSD, the National Institute of Sustainable Development, with various partners from around the world, is basically working uh, on operationalizing and implementing responsible agricultural investment principles in Southeast Asia. And we're doing this not just by generally saying it's a good idea, but we're working directly with, with the private sector, with companies, with governments, the 10 member countries of the ASEAN uh, region, and civil society and others. So I think you, know, you can actually get down to a very detailed way of dealing with these things uh, without going into some generalist policies that you think is a good idea and which cause problems. Um, then my final point is deglobalization in, in the main is actually shifting patterns of international activity. So if something, when something goes down here, something goes up there, it's basically not globalization stopping or starting, but rather there's some, some shifting in how things are happening. Much of this actually will affect developing countries. Uh, and we, again, there's a whole history of different things which have occurred over the last 10, 15, 20 years. But the most recent example is a pandemic. The pandemic is, is, a, is affecting, is disrupting global supply chains, global value chains. That is having an effect across all industries, across all regions, and especially in developed countries. The latest um, data is saying that, of course, the most advanced, most developed countries will actually emerge not too badly affected uh, from the pandemic in the next two or three years. That will not be the case for developing countries. They will be affected for a long time to come. And, and just to give an example, international tourism. It's one of the most affected countries. We all know none of us is traveling, right? I'm stuck here in France. Uh, and of course, it's affecting the poor, the poorest countries, the developers the most. 
But I, what I want to do is end with a with a point, which I think is not only just to say, okay, here's an issue, let's address it. And I think we do have to address it. But also, I think it's an opportunity, because in the case of international tourism, for instance, there is now a hiatus. Before we get from point A to point B, from where we are now to, to actually a better situation, where actually the level of activities is, is supporting development, is supporting um, the, 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 the uh, income streams of, of countries, is supporting the, the activity, economic activity, there is a time. And that time is a time to now to reflect and think carefully, how do we as developing countries, and here's a point or two, Abel, when you come on later, is how do, we actually, how do we actually address this? How do we try to solve some of the problems we have seen is happening from international tourist activity in and within and across our borders? And so, for example, um, if, you, if you take the issue of hotels, hotels are, are often owned by, by, by foreign operators or they're actually run by foreign operators, not owned by them. Um, you have tour operators, which are basically controlling how tours are operated within with Ken, within Kenya, within Tanzania, within many other developed countries. Th th that's a monopoly or, or, or a close monopoly. You have, you have the question of links with local agribusiness. By and large, with a lot of hotels that are in, in sort of resorts, they buy in produce from overseas. Why is there not better linkage with agribusiness? It's one of the things that we're dealing with at ISD. So these are issues actually which have not been addressed, I think, fully uh, by a long way. But now I think we, even though it's it's a painful period, this hiatus that poor countries are going through, it is time to now reflect and say, okay, what we can now start doing to make things better? Because, hey, there's disruption in the industry. Your hotels are actually not as powerful as they were. Your, your tourist operators are not as powerful as they were. Your foreign businesses are maybe not as powerful as they were. What can we do to actually try to make things better? So I'll stop there because I think I've gone a little bit over my time and pass over to Tani. Um, thank you, Hafez. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Alex for inviting me to participate in this panel discussion. The topic is really close to my heart. As personally, I'm a beneficiary of globalization. Had it not because of China's economic liberalization and China's integration into the global economy, I wouldn't be who I am and where I am today. Um, I grew up in rural China. Um, my parents were earning uh, roughly around five pounds a month. So that's 60 pounds a year when I was a child. So in fact, my family was also one of the better ones in our area as my father was an accountant and my mother was a teacher. So after China's opening up in 1978, my father started his own business engaging in international trade with Russia. So thanks to him, I could study in the UK. However, it is not just because of my personal experience. I'm very much for globalization, and I think globalization has a positive impact on international development. I also agree with Hafez that globalization needs to be managed. But I have spent 25 years teaching and researching on the impact of internationalization and globalization. And my research evidence also supports my view that the net effects of globalization on development are positive. So I will illustrate from three levels, at the country level, firm level, and individual level. At the country level, so if you take China as an example, according to World Bank data, before China's integration into the world economy in late 1970s, 835 million Chinese were living under the poverty line. But by 20, 2005, the figure fell to 208 million, representing a reduction of 627 million. So 627 million people have been lifted out of poverty. Similarly, in India, in, India began its economic reform in 1991, and about 50 million Indians were living under the poverty line in 1993. But by 2005, the figure was reduced to around 42 million, so a reduction of 8 million. At the firm level, a significant volume of research has established that internationalization is good for firms' innovation, productivity, and financial performance. In comparison to domestic firms, international firms often have more and are better information on markets and technologies and can access to resources that are either unavailable or more expensive in domestic markets. 
Internationalization offers firms greater learning and networking opportunities. Firms can also acquire knowledge directly from their business partners. They can also enjoy knowledge spillovers through embedding in the national business and the innovation systems of the host countries. I'm currently working on a systematic review of the existing evidence on the impact of internationalization on firm innovation. Using meta-analytical techniques, our results show that uh, at the aggregate, internationalization positively leads to innovation. There are also plenty of research that look at uh, the impact of internationalization on firm performance. Again, a lot of meta-analysis have shown that uh, internationalization is good for firm performance. So globalization has also enabled the developing countries manufacturing firms and non-manufacturing organization to catch up through imitation, first of all, to develop capabilities. And once the capabilities are developed, they engage in innovation. This is even true in the university sector. So for example, no Asian business schools made the grade in the first FT ranking in 1999. But thanks to the teaching research collaboration with the Western universities, there are many Asian business schools in FT league tables. So FT even ran a news article um, two years ago and and the title was Asian Business Schools Outpace the Rest of the World. Um, just before Easter, Hafez mentioned about you know, ecological environment. So I also did a paper looking at uh, the current empirical evidence on environmental performance of FDI in China. Uh, as the largest recipient of foreign direct investment, it is widely acknowledged that China's economic development has benefited from the significant inflows of foreign direct investment. But at the same time, foreign invested firms have been accused of relocating heavy polluting business to China, treating China as a pollution haven. But our systematic review of the existing literature shows that FDI leads to better environmental performance through reducing pollution, but not green total factor productivity. So our evidence actually supports the pollution hollow hypothesis, which emphasizes that the presence of foreign subsidiaries does not necessarily increase pollution levels in China. Instead, they can be more energy efficient and are likely to use cleaner energy than local firms. My last point at the individual level, um, Internationalization offers more entrepreneurial opportunities. Many born global firms exploit the global niche from the beginning of their operations. Consumers also benefit from globalization. Thanks to globalization, we have been enjoying cheaper goods and services. Um, FD yesterday, for example, reported that a British bank maker, um, Brompton, increased the prices by 6% at the start of the um, calendar year, but they could also increase the price further to about 10% because of the problems of soaring commodity prices, uh, supply chains, and of course, Brexit. Um, so this is the price that we pay when globalization is disrupted. But globalization is not only associated with the cross-borders flow of goods, services, capital, knowledge, and technologies. It is also linked to human capital. There is now established the literature on brain circulation. So back in 1950s and 60s, migration from developing countries to developed countries were considered to be great brain drain. But increasingly, what we have seen is brain circulation. So if we take Taiwan and India's IT industry as an example, of course, there are many reasons for their development. But partially, it needs to thank those Taiwanese and Indian diasporas who were trained and worked in the United States. I'm currently working on a project studying international knowledge transfer between China and Africa. Of particular significance within this context is the substantial number of African students in China. The number soared from under 1,800 in 2003 to 81,600 in 2018, which is more than 40 times increase in a short space of uh, 15 years. So when African students struggle to get visas to study in the West, China has opened its door to these people for higher education. 
none of this is to say globalization is perfect. I completely agree with Hafiz. Globalization needed to manage. The, there are winners and losers in the process of globalization. And of course, the biggest problem associated with globalization is income inequality. Uh, in fact, the World Economy Journal published a meta-analysis, and they also find that uh, um, globalization has increased the in income inequalities. But what we need to do is to manage globalization for the benefits of international development. And deglobalization certainly isn't the way forward. In fact, I just wanted to make a, a few um, points on this word deglobalization. There is nothing new about the cry of de there is nothing new about the cry of deglobalization. Whenever there is an economic crisis, deglobalization is mentioned. The current pandemic has a momentum to the deglobalization trend. But going back to history, after 2007 economic crisis, there was a period of heated debate on globalization versus deglobalization. 1997 Asian financial crisis called globalization into question. And of course, the globalization was in retreat during World War II. However, Economic history should have taught us international sustainable developments need more global integration, not less, so that resources can be better allocated and more efficiently utilized. And the global ecological environment can be collectively protected. So this is where I stand. I think overall globalization is good for international development and deglobalization isn't the way forward. So I'm passing it to Abel, please. Thank you very much, uh, Annie, <clears throat> and Afis for the introduction on uh, the topic, and Alexander for the invitation. I do say, share this, uh, the same sentiments about uh, what globalization and the world viewpoints that have been that are there that have to do with Africa, and uh, particularly I will base my discussion more in what I know about it in Kenya. Uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, we've done a lot of uh, studies about what is really happening in Africa from uh, east to west, north, south, where, with a couple of scholars from uh, some from the diaspora and others from the local. And we have looked at what, what is really happening in Africa. We have looked at the Africa competitiveness in the global economy. We have looked at the uh, uh, internationalization uh, within Africa. What is really happening? And uh, out of out of what I've seen is that uh, the world views sometimes sometimes they can they can give somebody either a positive or a negative uh, feeling. And uh, I, I'm going to hear my views based on that because uh, we 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 see a lot that is coming good as it has been discussed, and we also see some other things that that. Uh, probably that does not agree well with the with the globalization however that does not mean that the uh, globalization is bad it gives us some positive uh, issue areas like we have uh, fdis that come in technological innovations economy of skills labor mobility I think these, these are the points that have have been given but let me let me begin by giving you because i've been here in africa for more than 50 years now by giving my historical background so that we can have a, a better viewpoint on what, what are we really talking about. Let me begin by looking at, uh, I'll, I'll give uh, about six views. One I'll give on uh, the banking, I'll give on digital technology. Another one is on uh, forex related issues, some sectoral aspects, the African continental free trade area, uh, China investment in Africa, and then probably I can wrap up looking at the COVID. Now, when, when, when we grew up in Africa in the, in the 60s and the 70s, the big banks here were global banks, Standard Chartered, Bankless Bank, and what have you. When I started working way back in 1993, I was completely shocked because I came from India. That my studies from India. India did not know opening accounts was literally very easy. All right? If you have an account, a savings account, you are getting something from the, from the account. When we started working, the minimum to open an account in Bankless Bank was $500. That is impossible money. Nobody could get it. Okay. They were charging close to about $80 per month if you can't meet that, uh, that requirement. Now, what happened? 
And this is where now probably one has to look at the different viewpoints pro, pro, from maybe a capitalistic dimension vis-a-vis -vis a social responsive entrepreneurial dimension. Now, because things became very, very difficult for many of us, this is where now banks like Equity Bank, I don't know whether you, you have heard about them, but the other banks came in. And eventually what happened is that today, the biggest banks in Kenya are purely local banks. It is because they are meeting and mitigating social problems that could not be done from that uh, global dimension. But what I'm trying to put across is that there is also running. People are, people are also getting information from one end to the other. So we are, we are actually synergizing and working together as we run from that. Now, out of that, also there were some, what we refer to as cooperative uh, uh, related developments, which took place in all sectors and some of them became, uh, you, can, you can refer to them as micro banks. And a lot of people have gone into them. So there is a lot of savings and investment that has gone into this particular given area that if you look at, in terms of worldview, who is the biggest bank or who is the biggest financial institution? You may find that maybe the, the local the local market is offering what, what we are really looking for. Now, coupled with that, you look at uh, uh, developments in terms of the, the digital perspective. Now, this is where the, the, the case of uh, M-Pesa and uh, Safaricom comes in. Now, that is something that we, 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 I mean, came came to us as a shocker. Most of most of the people, whether in the urban or in the rural areas, were unbanked. Now, a lot of innovations, a lot of uh, developments have taken place within this particular given area, and and the model seems like it is sticking and working in different uh, in different parts of uh, of the of, of the of, of the continent. So th there is there is yes, what is happening uh, outside that is coming in. And at the same time, we can we can be able to adopt it. Like uh, if you the, the example of uh, e-tax e hailing services like uh, Huber, when they came to the local market, of course there was a lot of resentment. But guess what happened? They have been replicated. There are several other competing small small companies that are doing the same the same work that is being done by the the global firm. So the same is happening in other online businesses. And even, even in uh, online learning, still there is a lot of, uh, 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 there is a lot of uh, uh, innovations that are coming in that particular given age. So what I'm trying to put across is that with, with globalization or with labor mobility, with information technology, with the coming up of uh, the digital economy, the fourth industrial revolution, there is a lot we are really seeing that are also positive in that particular given dimension. So it's like there is room, there is literally room for everybody uh, in, this, in, this, in this part of the, of the world. So there is, there, there is a, the global pa pa participation, there is also the, the local participation, there is the regional participation, all of them are coming in in, uh, in place. Now, another, another area that one has, has to look at is how are we really doing this business? I think Afis talked about we are having a lot of uneven, uneven levels. Now, trading, trading mainly, we are trading using uh, uh, for, for foreign exchange, which is which is not available. So some some countries were literally had no choice but to start export processing zones as areas where they can they can they can produce and sell and blah 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 have some some revenue. So it's an area where a lot of opportunities have come come in. A lot of even uh, China investment companies have come in in support of uh, of uh, some uh, uh, inno innovation apps that people can use to diversify production in different areas. Now, out of the labor mobility, also we have seen uh, diaspora remittance. There is a lot of inflows that is coming from uh, from from the from uh, 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 people from outside Africa. And for example, last year alone. In Kenya, we netted nearly about three hundred and forty-one million dollars. You know, which is which is which is good money to stabilize a part of the trading systems within this part part of the world. Now, there is also the dimension of the promotion of local industries, which has been going on, on and on and on. And I'll give you a very good example of what has happened with the COVID to to resolve some of the issues 
because uh, as it has been observed, we had, we had literally nothing. But we have seen some, some, some companies come in to provide personal protective uh, equipment. We have seen uh, uh, nations come put up a uh, 150 band uh, capacity hospital. We have seen a company called Revital Health Care be, being among the six pre-qualified companies by World Health Organization to provide the uh, auto dis dis disabled syringes for fixed dose immunization against uh, uh, COVID-19. So the, 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 there are pluses and minuses that are taking place that we should, we should always, uh, I think also, as we discuss the downside and the positive, we should also put them in, in place because we stand to, to benefit. Now, there was also the mention, a first mention about the tourism and hospitality. These, these are our domains. The fact that they have been affected by, by, by wildlife does not mean we have also a global positioning. You know, it is part of what we are offering to the world and it's part of our beauty and it's part of part of area that we would want to, to spearhead. Another area which is also our domain here is in the floriculture, in the horticultural sector, which we have been doing business with the European Union, UK for, for many years. Finally, what 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 has also come in very well is that we have now what we are referring to as the, the Africa continental free trade area. And with it, there is regional market integration. And there are a lot of a lot of dimensions. There are some regional com commonalities that are coming in. There are social cultural factors coming in, economic factors. Because if, if you if you if Africa gets and we are ending there, the infrastructure that we are we are really looking for, there will be a lot of intra-African trade, intra-African movement. There is a lot of it's a big market, 1.2 billion, with with close to about uh, three trillion dollars market. We are seeing it is also big that people can 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 get a share of what they have, and and China has done a lot because China has found there is a correlation between infrastructure development and economic development. So there is a lot that has taken place. And I can tell you, when you come, when, when you, you physically pay a visit to some of these areas, what you are going to see is, is something that is unique. And uh, that one, one, one can, can say even this side of the, of the world has something to offer to the rest of the world. So th in, my, in my conclusion, what I'm trying to put across is that it looks like there is something for every part of the world right? Differences being there, there are also advantages. And every, 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 every region is trying to position itself either for globalization or to mitigate what, what is really missing. Because ultimately, we have to really reduce the, 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 the income levels, we have to reduce poverty, we have to create a world that is even. I think this is the ultimate purpose. And I think even when we talk of a uh, the, the SDGs and even the Millennium Development Goals, we are we are in agreement. The idea is to bring some commonalities globally. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all three for these interesting um, and comments. I do have quite a lot of questions, but maybe I'd start with just uh, you know a more generic question, which actually I didn't think would we would discuss that much in detail, but I think that starts when what Hafi said and, and Ani mentioned also about the, the managed globalization and the unfettered globalization that should be. I think that's, that's of course, um, often, and, and the, the negative consequences that you mentioned, one of you was um, the, the, the increasing inequality, right? So that seemed to be one of the, the key issues. But interestingly, of course, that is also one of the main justifications for a lot of the, the more nationalist and, and populist um, policies, which I see as more deglobalization or as more protectionist, right? So I see there's a bit of a, of a trade off. On the one hand, we, we don't want to have these negative consequences of um, globalization if we think about within country income inequality, let's say, right, where benefits of globalization are not shared equally and so on. Um, but on the other hand, the consequence or one consequence of that being more protectionist or using the American jargon of whatever, creating um, American jobs for American workers, for instance, and Hafiz mentioned, I think, Detroit and so on. So the, the, the question is that if that is the consequence, you know, 
you also mentioned that these populist and nationalist policies are not good, right? Because you said they were, Hafiz mentioned that they were not good for, or they would be in conflict with the achievement of the SDGs and so on, right? So, so how do you view this, this contradiction here? On, on the one hand, you know, some aspects of globalization are not good and need to be managed better, but the way they are currently seem to be addressed are not good either, right? How, would, how do you view this? imbalance or this contradiction in a sense and what would be maybe some some solution for that what would be a better way of managing these these downsides of globalization maybe i don't know hafiz maybe wants to go first yeah um the the fact that there's a problem doesn't mean that the answer is correct and, and that is the big issue that, you know, it's very easy to say, OK, we've lost our jobs, our incomes are reducing. Um, let's blame China. Let's blame uh, Kenya. Let's blame somewhere else. Because, because that's not necessarily the solution. Your jobs are not going to come back to you by just shifting car production back to, 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 to uh, the USA, for example, in, in the example of Detroit I've given you. So, so actually, there is an issue. The issue is actually as a result of the movement of capital, the movement of production, movement of activities and so on, uh, people do suffer. And just to give an, an example, you know, because Annie said, on average, globalization is a good thing. My point here is simply, if your head is in the oven and your, fridge, your, and your feet are in the fridge, on average, you're comfortable. The average is not enough. And that's what's happening here. The people actually don't realize what the consequences are. So you need to deal with the consequences. You need to better explain to people actually what is actually happening. Um, we all want to go back to a better way. We all want to, you know, we're all basically at some level lazy, we want to maintain our, 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 our core values. Um, but things are changing. Even if there was no FDI, even if there's no expansion of international production by companies in various ways, uh, provided, this, provided that, that there is not a high level of autarky so that you don't trade with each, each other, there will ultimately be a shift in production from, for example, the, the USA to China to India elsewhere. The net result of that is there will be movement of activity, whoever does it. So you need to deal with it. And the one way to, to deal with it is to say, okay, if you have an international economy and you want to try to to maximize the overall yield, how do you actually make sure that everybody actually benefits from it? And then, you know, that requires policies, and that's a, a key issue here that's not being addressed. It requires policies which are appropriate to the problem, to the issue. Simply saying, let's put up the drawbridge, let's stop trading, let's, let's beat up the, the guys next door, that is not a solution. Understanding what the problem is, is asking where do you want to go with it, how do you want to resolve it, that's where the issue is. For how the thing is resolved. For example, you know, Anis mentioned about pollution in China. Okay, it's true that today there's not much pollution in China as a consequence of FDI. In the past, there was. Well, this is passed uh, as part of the international production process using contractors locally in China. But the big key issue is that the Chinese have put in place policies to reduce pollution. The international community has put in, into, into place policies to actually reduce pollution down the value chain. And that is having a consequence in terms of how much pollution is occurring in certain industries in China, which is all to the good, not entirely. But you need to have appropriate policies. Simply having a problem and finding a solution which is inappropriate takes you nowhere. All right, have I my say? <laughs> all right, would you like to comment on it, Annie or Abel, maybe? Okay. Um, I think I will use steel industry as an example. So um, I mentioned about this case, the, this UK uh, company producing bikes have increased their price. But uh, over the past decades, what we have seen is the steel industry in the UK has struggled. The steel industry in, the Euro in Europe and the United States have all struggled. So lots of people working for steel industry have lost out. Hence, there is a call for protectionism uh, or call of protecting the industry. But what have we seen? 
Qatar has two subsidiaries in Europe, one in Holland, one in the United Kingdom. And actually, the subsidiaries in Holland were in protest because they were concerned that they were making profit. But in order to help the UK subsidiaries, the finance had been transferred from profitable subsidiary to a loss-making subsidiary. So, you know, we, we have been in this um, fight in developed countries. Is that a solution? To me, I think globalization's problem needs to be managed if we know what the problems are. In the case of steel industry, I think the way forward is not to protect the industry. You can never protect um, a particular industry. You lost your comparative advantage. The basic trade theory suggests um, you cannot rescue it because it will be just a forever loss making business. The way forward, I think, is training and development so that we can help the steel workers to develop new skills, expertise. And another thing is, in fact, many of these people lose jobs. They're not losing jobs to China. They're losing jobs to technologies. To be honest, I'm also concerned about how this AI technology is going to go, how that's going to replace, replace people. Today, I reviewed a funding application of my colleagues, and they are not using, you know, when you do interviews, you, you, in the past, we hire people to transfer transcribe for us. Now they're going to use technologies to do the transcriptions. So the people who in the past can earn their living, make their living using transcription uh, service, now lost their job to technologies. What can they do? So my point is, I think, you know, in terms of policy, I totally agree with her face. Policy is important, but policy should also be important in terms of helping people to be retrained for different Businesses. I, I, I also do concur with the uh, and their fees that we really need a, 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 an even even business model. It doesn't make sense, for example, in the shipping uh, business, and we under a case of a, a ship that uh, got stuck in the Suez Canal. It doesn't make sense why you have, as it is stated, fifteen of the biggest uh, ships. They produce like 80% of the world pollution. And, and what they are doing is they are moving raw materials from Africa. They take them maybe to China, process them, and then they bring the finished product in uh, to Africa. What, 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 I mean, we, we did have to sober, sober up because they can be processed and shipped as finished products at, uh, at, at, at where, where they, are, they, are, they, are, they are being found. So what I'm trying to put, put across is that if, if, if we can level the, the playing field, I think there'll be a part that every person can play, which can, which can give us uh, an, an, equal, an equal trending situation. And I think uh, this is where technology is coming in and is giving us, is given, giving up African advantage or even other developing countries an advantage because in the in the conventional uh, manufacturing model, most of most of these most of these countries do not uh, take advantage. And then also, when you look at issues like the brain drain and things like that, when when you seek cheap labor from these countries and then you export it, it it doesn't act well for the growth of some regions. So it's, it it doesn't make sense why we can say globalization is good. Globalization is bad, but when you look at the outcome of some of them, you, the resources have been completely depleted. There's there's nothing left in that particular given territory, and all this is in the name of uh, making money. So I think if we can have a level playing ground, that would be good for everybody, and we can participate all of us in one way or the other on the global platform. All right, thank you. I mean. One thing that Hafiz mentioned, I liked his um, metaphor. Of, what was it? The person with the head in the oven and, and, and the the feet in, in in the freezer or something. That on average you're, you're you know comfortable. And but but my question, I was wondering, you know, that's not really new. I mean, like economic theory or trade theory has always mentioned that you know the benefits of trade accrue as as a net effect for the overall wealth and the distribution then of this additional wealth is. A political issue, right? I mean, that's 
it has been out of the question. I mean, it has never probably been properly communicated. So my, my question would be, um, why do you think that might change now, right? Which you, I mean, if you've said that this should change and, you know, this needs to be addressed, but I mean, as I said, this is not something that has come up yesterday, right? This has been something that we've, we've dealt with um, for, for a long time, presumably. And that also relates to the point that Annie made earlier about the um, the episodes that, you know, there's also this discontent with the globalization right after a, um, a crisis, let's say, right? So there, there are these waves of um, globalization and deglobalization as some sort of tidal nature of this international business. And so, so but that implies that we're going back to normal, right? And which means we might forget about all these distribution effects once more, and then until the next crisis, however it may look like, um, strikes. So the question is how, what makes you hope or think that this cycle can be broken? Maybe Hafiz? Your microphone is not on <laughs> now right yeah no i was gonna say is that if we don't do it now we're all doomed um, <laughs> because the uh, you know the, uh, at one level okay we can discuss the globalization deglobalization or whatever you want to call it we can discuss the ebbs and flows of things and of course there are always winners and losers that's that's as you say there's nothing new about that but one thing that is a consequence of globalization is actually the scale of the whole activity is now vast. The consequences are vast. I fully agree with you that, that you know, after the financial crisis, for example, global financial crisis, there was a lot of promise to do things and nothing happened. And I think that's still the issue. And, and I think one of the problems is actually, uh, again, you're right about this, is when it comes to international initiatives, often nothing happens because, of course, there are disruptors. There's people who actually are preventing some sort of solution because, of course, they're looking at their particular personal interests as a nation or even as, as, as individuals. That's an issue. But that, that has a change. And so, um, you know, sometimes I have very pessimistic days. I think you're right. <laughs> that we, that, but what I also see at the same time is that actually, first of all, um, there are a lot of initiatives which are localized, which are being done by individuals, groups, nations, regions. You know, the Asin Group, for example, is one that I'm working with. I think, and again, Abel is working obviously in, 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 uh, in parts of Africa. I think, I think there's some hope there, which is encouraging, but not, not enough. The other thing is that I think that when it comes to things like, for example, climate change, climate crisis, more and more people are realizing there is an issue. You know, a few years ago, China would have been where India is now saying, actually, um, all you guys, you, you know, in the, in the advanced countries, you polluted for centuries. It's about time we do the same thing. Now they're saying very different. They're saying, look, we recognize actually pollution is not a good thing. We recognize that there is a climate crisis. We are going to try and move more and more towards renewables, right? So there's a shift even at the national level. I think more and more countries, more and more companies are moving towards that. You still have some countries, I think, who are still issues. You still have some companies who are linked to that who are issues. But I think there is a, 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 a shift which hopefully will occur in the next 10 years, because otherwise we're definitely all doomed. <laughs> um, I think, you know, globalization is still going to be the way forward because for many people, they have multiple roles. Um, so, so for example, like ourselves, we have the role of both a worker and uh, a consumer. So as a worker, we're worried that our jobs will be taken away by other people, machines, technologies, etc. But as consumers, we demand for cheaper products. So I think there will always be a demand for globalization, global integration, so that uh, our needs can be fulfilled, our demands can be met. Moving forward, um, I think uh, international organizations need to take uh, better leadership. So, you know, um, the reason we set up World Bank, um, IMF, et cetera, et cetera, is to hope um, we can coordinate a better, um, you know, the world will become a better place. We can avoid uh, the third world war. Um, but 
the international organizations are not effective. So, you know, for example, WTO was set up in 1995. And then in 1999, we had the Seattle protest that was against WTO because they didn't see WTO be effective. International trade was not helping with the developing countries, certain group of people. So, so people were discontent. Um, but afterwards, you know, since 1999, has WTO done better job? You know, the things do have around. What has happened? Um, so I think WTO needed to do better in terms of leading trade, leading the discussion of international trade. And again, if you look at the WHO, actually, you know, World Health Organization, in fact, I think WHO really demonstrated their important role during this pandemic. Had it not because of their work, their initiatives, yeah, um, we probably will be in pandemic for a much longer period. So I think you know, we need international organizations, the multilateral organizations yeah, to take a better leadership in order to help to drive things forward in a more positive direction. And, and you know, Abel said about level playing field, we need these multilateral organizations yeah, to help us creating the level playing field. Otherwise, yeah, it will still be, you know, some powers dominant and the other powers uh, voice, sorry, the other countries voice will not be heard. Abel, after you. I think I'm in agreement. It's it's uh, what 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 I think the time is now as a fees and is putting it across. Uh, Africa has done business with the West for for nearly about hundred years of plus, but most of them have uh, moved east. And they are not going to turn back uh, overnight. It is the, is the reality on the ground. We can we cannot be friends doing business if if my my role is becoming poor on daily basis, right? And your role is to make as much money as you can. It, I think you, in principle the business model on which we have been uh, practicing for many years may not be as a See that it's not it's not even, and now that the information flow is is available to everybody, everyone is knowing literally what everyone is doing in other part of the world. It it we have no choice but to look for solutions that can give us uh, a, a fair playground. Thank you. All right, if I can just maybe now um, follow up on on the. Um, the international development aspect a bit more because at the, the beginning we said that, you know, uh, I think Hafiz mentioned it that the, the far, the East Asian countries have developed based on this export led growth through, you know, being part, you know, participants in global value chains and, you know, recipients to FDI that produced locally and so on. Now, if that changes, right, and, and, and I assume there is some sort of change, and I think Hafiz has mentioned that, that as well, um, how does, how do countries develop that are, you know, at the early stages of development, right, so not the East Asian, not the, the Tigers or whatever they're called, but, you know, let's say countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think Abel has, you know, in, I read your, 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 your paper, and, and I think there are quite a few, you know, you know uh, alternative ways, I think that's what you mentioned, uh, called it alternative strategies for development. So my question will be, so what are some of these alternative strategies to um, foster economic development, right, in these new changed conditions, right? Shall we start with Hafiz again, or maybe Ivo wants to go first because that's your. Yeah, thank area. you very much. Thank you very much. When 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 uh, when you look at uh, the Chinese model model in terms of uh, what you have just mentioned of uh, outsourcing or uh, relying on on uh, other other manufacturers. So we, we have a participative uh, production where a different part of uh, a, a product or something is being done in one area. So 
we, we create uh, we create uh, advantages that cut across. So is not not you see not not picking things in the in the raw form. Maybe up up to a given up to a given level that it becomes a part, a component of a, of another or of, of another process. So in the value in the global value chain, we we keep on we we have to look at the the value that maybe a sub-Saharan African country can do in agriculture. What up to what level? You know, at least we move. If if it was absolute role, then we then we qualify and say let's let's move it to level three. We we can't all of us be at the same level, but at least adding value in that particular given process would be a better way of trying to have a participatory developmental model. That is my take. Maybe Hafiz, you want to uh, comment? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, no, I, I agree, Abel. Um, but what I'd also like to say is basically, ultimately, I think we, we depend on three three things. One is um, comparative advantage. And he's already mentioned that, Abel's mentioned that. But let's not forget that comparative advantage is created. You know, it's not simply what you have, it's what you can make. I think going back to our earlier discussion, one of the problems of, say, Detroit is that they've not really thought, actually, what can we make, as opposed to how do we create a new advantage rather than simply dwell on what you've lost. The same applies uh, uh, across the world. The second thing that links that, of course, is policy. You need to have policies to do this. And, and I think that is the case with, with Asia, certainly the case in Africa, all the different initiatives in Africa are looking to how you can actually create policies which create a framework to, to develop a comparative advantage and to connect that comparative advantage both domestically and to international companies. There's a whole range of things you can do there. There's so much to talk about here. I won't try and do that. But the other thing is you, you require is patience. It won't happen overnight. It takes time. Um, and, you know, it, it, Andy won't like this because there's, there is actually no China model. The China model is essentially a model that was created by uh, the Germans way, way back in the, the 19th century as a result of developing against an onslaught by uh, American, not American, so United, uh, United Kingdom, um, uh, a trade advantage. And to do that, you had to create a system whereby you could actually create your own advantage to be able to, to, to basically offset that advantage by the, by the British and to, to, do, to get involved in international trade. That was then, then just taken by Japanese, taken by people in Southeast Asia, then taken by the Chinese. Um, so actually, it's the basic issue is how do you create a basis for development, given that all the way around you, there are only people who are proficient in international trade, in international production, in technology, and so on. That's where Abel comes in. He's, he's saying, let's create a comparative advantage in parts of Africa. So the lesson there is, you, you can do it. But I would first say the first thing is patience. It won't happen overnight. You need to sort of be developing policies which actually try to take existing situations and make them better, understand what it will mean in terms of how you how you actually integrate into, into, into international economy, and then, and then be very, very flexible. It takes time. Um, there's no time to put it. You, know, you can then look into different models which have been tried by different countries. And for example, there's some which rely very much on FDI, others rely much more on trade, others which rely on, 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 on uh, becoming much more suppliers through local small firms. There's a whole range of ways of doing it, but all those things exist as ideas which can be used by developing countries who are even at their lowest end who actually sort of make their way forward and try to move up by creating an advantage which allows them to integrate into the global economy. Um, actually, Hafiz, I agree with you. I don't believe there is a China model. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, um, the way I see it, because I, you know, like uh, Alex um, introduced me, uh, I spent a lot of time looking at uh, uh, foreign direct investment in China, its determinants and its impact. Um, so I also uh, taught a module called Economies of China and India. So we try to compare the development of China versus the development of India. So based on that, I have some understanding of China's economic development. Um, so if we go back to 1978, what happened for China was there was a close economy China actually saw the development of South Korea 
the tigers and the MITs, Malaysia, Indi Indonesia, and Thailand. They really envied the development of those countries, but in particular South Korea. So China decided to try this opening up, but partially. So China started to develop with the special economic zones and moving to coastal areas and then to the inland areas. So the way I see it, the Chinese model, China model is actually just the economic liberalization. It is very much fragmented, uh, pregnant uh, pr pragmatic sorry um very practical um sort of economic development let's try something out if it works we move on to the next step so it's very much incremental um the the chinese saying is uh, you know touching the stones or crossing the river um and they also very much for this it doesn't matter what the ownership of the companies foreign ownership private firms uh, collective owned enterprises as long as you make a profit you're fine so um doesn't matter whether you are the uh, is it a uh, black cat or white cat as long as you can catch the mouse i think that that's the chinese saying um so it's very much um pragmatism um but so but i think if there is a chinese model it's very much uh in terms of their operations in africa um the china model in africa is the integration of aid trade and foreign direct investment um i haven't done enough research so i don't have authority to say whether this is effective um because in terms of china's model of the integration of trade aid and foreign direct investment uh, um we have seen some success some chinese multinationals are very very effective in their operations in africa they have managed to win uh base they have managed to build the road uh railways and many of the infrastructures but I'm not a big fan of government intervention. From where I stand, I always think a government intervention creates inefficiency. Um, I think the Chinese firms have relied too much on the government's help. Whether these firms are truly efficient firms, the best firms for the businesses, I'm not sure. Like I said, I'm not an um, expert in this particular area, hence I can't really say much. But I think only time can tell whether this China's model of the integration of trade aid and foreign direct investment will work and will offer greater benefits to the host countries. All right, now, it's now surprising to... though, um, Anna, you said that you don't believe in government intervention because you, you gave us a good example of Chinese intervention, you know, recognizing the success of nearby countries and try to emulate, them, right? I think what you're trying to say is you don't, you don't think governments should try to pick winners. So you create conditions within which business can actually uh, become more effective. Um, so that, which is different. You create you create conditions. You can also uh, try to support some industries because, of course, you will be dealing with situations where foreign companies are much more effective. Yeah, and that's the old infinite industry argument. So the case where actually the government has a very important role is not intervention saying actually you 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 this company you're going to really do well. We're going to put a lot of resources into. You. That's a different story. And even that has, has some interesting discussions that we could be having, but I won't discuss that now. I think there is a very big role for government in all this. Well, you know, I like, agree. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I think what I'm trying to say is there are different types of government interventions. Yeah. There is a government interventions of government in guiding the business initiatives, uh, business operations. Yeah. But then there is a government uh, interventions in terms of creating the right policy. So, for example, the industrial policies government have um, employed over the past decades yeah. for some industries it has certainly been very successful and the businesses um, have improved you know huawei is a typical example of benefiting from government support but i think a government intervention is um is not a straightforward answer it, it depends on what sort of government interventions we're discussing yeah and can i just agree with that and just pass the question to 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 abel because i agree with that i think it all depends also on the nature of the government, right? In other words, is this dictator on side? Is he, is he trying to do something for the country or is he trying to do something for himself? So I think there's, there is a, you know, who actually, who actually is in control, their purpose, their motives are actually very important. So I, I want to able, do you have any views about that? Um, I, 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 I think my, 
the, the way I've seen uh, China state uh, enterprises uh, working in Kenya and uh, the private investors uh, coming in, I, I think uh, the, the government is coming in in, in big in big infrastructural uh, projects, and and these were the missing the missing gaps in terms of uh, spreading uh, uh, economic related uh, growth activities. So that that to, to me that is a that, that is a plus. Now the, the the private companies also they have they have been uh, supporting in terms of uh, in the in the production in the production of materials that are that are really not available within the the continent. So they they are really utilizing the local resources in support of uh, the infrastructure development. But as I think uh, I concur with uh, both your arguments that. Uh, Time will tell. Time will tell. But uh, for now, I think uh, we are we are looking at it from a, a brighter point of view. So good. It's a good move. So maybe I can ch chip in here, and of course, because we spoke about the, the Chinese model and the, the state intervention, which I guess has become fashionable well, to some extent. And, you know, even in countries such as Germany, you have really, they talk about more about national champions and industrial policy and so on. So, but but the overall um, question I would have, and also Annie mentioned the, the activities of, of the Chinese companies in, in Africa. Um, some commentators suggested there would be some sort of bifurcation of the, the global economy, right? In a Chinese dominated block and the US dominated block. Do you see that coming? Or do you, do you think that will happen? And, and if it does happen, how does that affect, in, in a sense, the, you know, the, the, let's say, the policies of countries that are not part of that block as it regards, to, as it relates to, to international development? Um, I think there's a small chance, but I, I, I don't think it's a very big chance. There's been a lot of discussion about, for example, a China-led block of, of nations who are autarkic and you know, or populist and so on and so forth. And I, don't, and I don't think that will happen. For, for a start, China depends on selling goods, buying goods from the rest of the world. So to actually close itself off and become a block in some fashion and, 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 and so on doesn't make a lot of sense from, from an economic point of view. And, you know, and, and, I, and I think the Chinese leadership are pretty rational in this respect. Um, the danger will be when countries take emotional, take emotional reactions, take, respond in an emotional way to, for example, the pandemic. You know, we've had this issue with regard to AstraZeneca with, with the UK, Europe, and so on. And when, when people's lives are in danger or people's jobs are being lost, you always go for knee-jerk reactions. That's where the, the danger of populist policies is it is, is, is most problematic. But I think, generally speaking, I think that th there are enough forces in the world pushing back against that for it not to be a, a serious thing to, con to contemplate. But it, it, is, it is a small possibility, I would have thought. All right, Ali, do you want to say something on that? And um, yeah, um, well, I think I think. This is very much, you know, to me, it's a media sort of propaganda. Um, this reminds me of, you know, in the media, there's a lot of um, discussion about China's buying the world. If you look at China's outward foreign direct investment, but China isn't one of the largest uh, leading investors. Um, the leading investors are still very much developed countries. It's United Kingdom, United States, Germany, France, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you look at China's investment in Africa, China lending money to Africa, for example. Again, the biggest um, uh, creditor for African debt is still developed countries. China owns. Uh, is it a 17% of African um, debt? So I think to me, I, th I think it just, you needed to create a straw man to attack. And at this point, China is that straw man. So I'm not sure China is one of the greatest power. You know, it, it has increased its economic power. It has improved. The people's life has become better. It has leading in certain technological field, but 
to me, I think the word has many powers. United States, Europe, unfortunately, UK, you know, because of Brexit, I'm not sure where UK is, but increasingly because of the intra-African trade, who knows, African continent probably will become a rising power. That <laughs> probably that will happen. I mean, over the time, I think uh, g g using what uh, Afis was talking about comparative, I, people are doing different things even in this African market. I, I, I mentioned China is more and is, is known in the infrastructure side of it. I mean, US, they are doing more in the, they are in the service area. So I think we are, the, each one is doing a different thing, but when you look at it from a, the reality perspective, it, it is making things work. It is making things work because it's, it's adding a price on a side which was not really thinking. It's like saying service alone may not may not make make somebody happy, for example, or may not give you what you are really looking for. But different com different parts in in what is is good for development. If it's added a bit here and bit there and bit there, I think we all 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 of us be moving in the right direction. So it it is a, it is complementing, as 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 opposed to what the media has been trying to put across because I think uh, the, 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 the Western media is that uh, Africa has been sold uh, for literally for a penny to China. That's, that's the argument. Okay, these are debts, but uh, I don't think you can compare infrastructural debts compared to human rights, a debt of human rights. It's, these are two different things. Yeah, because one will definitely you do something. If if I take the if I give the example of the SGR, the railway from uh, Mombasa, which has now ended up in Nairobi, and some people are saying the road is nowhere, or the rail is nowhere. Th that this lady is going all the way to 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 DRC Congo, and I can tell you that moment, that one day that that will become functional. I I, I mean through connecting through several landlocked country. In Africa, things will completely change, and they will change for better. So yes, ultimately by agenda, you know, Africa has an agenda 2063, where we are saying we will also become a superpower. So by 2063, who knows? We may also be somewhere in the map. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'm looking at the, at the comments on, on YouTube and there's only one comment that uh, if the factories come back, doesn't guarantee that the jobs will return. I think we've discussed it and there's some other comments, but they're in Turkish, I think. And as I don't speak Turkish, it's a bit rusty, my Turkish. I cannot tell you what these comments are. But now we have seven minutes left. So, I mean, one thing we haven't really spoken about and I would be very interested in hearing your opinion on is actually... The, the, the role of the multinational enterprises now, right? So because so now we've spoken about, you know, development on a macro and a policy level, but what I would be interested in is what does this deglobalization, you know, however you define it, or this trend, the ongoing trends, uh, mean for um, how multinationals operate? And, and I think um, Abel has mentioned a, a quite few interesting things in his, uh, now in, in his talk and also in, in um, his paper about you know, new models of governance. And I think also Hafiz in his uh, study, I think he had a paper where um, you know, uh, he, he highlights the issue of governance as a means or the governance of how you know, organizations are, are run as a means to achieve uh, the SDGs. So my question would be, what changes do you foresee for how uh, multinationals operate in, um, in developing countries and maybe also how firms from developing countries internationalize and, and the, the, the governance modes they use. Is there something like, um, I, I think one of you mentioned that the public-private partnerships um, as one way, I think Abel mentioned in his um, article, which I found very interesting, the, the, the role of cooperatives, right? Is there a potential model for a multinational cooperative or something like that? So, so do you have any, any, any view on how this will change, how multinationals will adjust here. Mm. 
I think, uh, am I on? Yes. Uh, when, when I look at uh, what the social, the social models in business are doing, and I think it's, it's not only in Africa, it's even happening in, uh, in, the, in, in other parts of the world. I think there, there is a bigger concern in terms of uh, how they are really working. I'll give you an example which has been given uh, many times about uh, IBM, where IBM used to hire uh, engineers to so many of them so that they can solve uh, their problems. But ultimately, they discovered that if, if they scout for ideas, knowledge, how they are in the open, there, there will be a lot of insights that they can pick and learn and they can, they can grow. They can get them, mobilize them, and work them together. So I think what 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 I what what I've seen is that um, Mondeos had cut across what I refer to me I call it uh, horizontal through horizontal integration, horizontal integration, which means you are trying to bring as many people as possible on that particular given platform, and and uh, the cooperative is a very good uh, model on that. The public. Uh, private partnership. We have a very good example of uh, uh, Express Highway in, uh, in Nairobi, uh, which is about uh, 23 kilometers uh, connecting two different uh, parts where there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, traffic jam. This is being done by China Loans at Bridge Corporation. Now, the, the, the project is for about uh, 20, 27 years and it's costing about uh, uh, 630 million US dollars. Now, this is this is not a loan, right? This is not a loan. It, it's, it's, it, this is a business. Somebody is, is getting in, you do the business, but you recover your money over time. You know, now th these are these are models that are really making making a lot of sense that I don't need to get in until you pay. I can, I can also say, let me do it, and we work together as a nation, you work together as Sub-Saharan Africa, and over years, because we, we, are, we are here on Earth for a reasonable period of time, maybe another 200, 300, a million years. So we, we, are, we are growing together, and, and I think this is, this is my contention, that multinational companies that will work with people to do what, what, the, what, what is supposed to be done, maybe train people, empower them, create maybe even those cooperative models to en empower them, th th it becomes bigger and bigger because we have, we have one, of, uh, one of the Kenyan, uh, Kenya Tea Development uh, Authority, KTDA, and it has brought in about, uh, near about 500,000 uh, small farmers, and they are the same people who are producing tea that is going to the UK market, is, is being bought in Pakistan. So yes, prayers can come in, but the using a different way of engagement. That was my take. Um, so I think Alex, the, the question of, of um, developing country companies and how they expand is too big to I think cover in two minutes. So I'm not gonna try and do it. Well, I'd say there are plenty of examples from around the world which can be taken on board. Taiwan, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, in, from, from my background in Asia, um, but elsewhere too. But that's for another, I think for another meeting. But just to say in terms of, of major multinationals and how they're trying to respond to the issues of globalization what, you know, and, and the consequences is, it, it's being taken serious by them. And I'm, I'm working, for example, with a, a group of, of investment funds, um, uh, sort of microfinancing institutions, and especially agribusinesses, which are trying to channel resources from the investment funds down to where it's required in developing countries. And the way that they're trying to do when we're working with them to do this is to try to create um, basically tools to ensure that the funding given by the investment funds to intermediary funds, which eventually is then channeled to agribusiness and then used by agribusinesses, to, to, to do the right things in terms of SDGs, in terms of uh, the impact on, on women, in terms of the impact on the environment, 
or is it actually done through a process? So eventually what you have is what the actual net result is from the annual business is, is then fed back all the way through the investment fund. So what they're along the line, actually first trying to make sure that you put the policy, right policies and techniques and tools in place. Secondly, actually monitor what's happening. And thirdly, try to respond to that in a way that which is effective, which means that actually the next stage of the investment funding cycle, which then goes to your agribusiness, is then done differently to make sure that the agribusiness is actually complying in a way that is effective for sustainable development. So the point I'm making here is actually that there are, there are plenty of, of multinationals out there who are very serious about this, uh, who are trying to create systems, because the biggest problem actually is not so much as individuals, we all have views about sustainability, how, how you make that work in, in, a, in an organization setting is something different, because there's a system, there's an organization culture, is there's a way it works. And so, for example, the investment funds have been working with us to create um, basically a performance and management tool that looks specifically at how individuals within organizations are operated to make sure that they actually are complying with, with the overall principles that we all signed up to, of course, nobody's actually implementing. So there is activity on the ground, which actually you know, means that multinationals are taking this seriously. And these are guys who are household names, that actually um, that uh, in the financial industry, the agricultural industry, in the intermediate industry are really taking this sort of th thing seriously. Do you like to comment, Amy? I just have one thing to say. You know, multinationals are no longer just to serve the interests of shareholders. Increasingly, they need to take into account of the views of stakeholders. Yeah. And with, you know, the, the advantage with globalization is uh, um, multinationals are not, they can't hide their dirty business in their backyards. Yeah. They are under the monitoring of media, local community, you know, where is the stakeholders? Is they have to respond and to be responsible businesses. I think that's actually uh, quite quite interesting. The the you know how multinationals now implement the the the, the SDGs or don't implement, right? That's probably the, the bigger issue. And, and also how that relates to international development. And I would have a lot more questions on that to discuss, but unfortunately we've run out of time. And um, so I guess we have to um, call it a day here. And um, so I would like to thank my three panelists here once again for their insightful contribu contributions, for their you know, stimulating my ideas now that I have to go back and probably, you know, worry about all these different things that I've heard. Um, I would also like to thank the, um, the audience out there, follows us on the um, internet. And of course, I would also like to thank the, the organizers um, here for uh, setting up this um, event. All right, so thank you very much and Keep safe, stay healthy, and have a good evening or good morning, as Hafi said, whoever you are in the world. All right. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.